Good evening. My name is Stephen Wolfolk. I'm the Director of Programming and Marketing for the Kansas City Public Library. Welcome to this latest installment in our online signature event series. Before we get started, I want to mention that tonight's program is being co-presented by our friends at Rainy Day Books. I don't need to tell you that we're living in a time when independent booksellers and other small businesses need our support more than ever. So I hope you will visit them online at rainydaybooks.com. Also, if you have questions this evening, please feel free to put those in the comments or in the chat, and we'll get to as many of those as possible. Tonight, we welcome Tom Zollner for a discussion of his new book, The National Road, Dispatches from a Changing America. His book will be called a travelogue or a collection of travel essays, and I suppose it is, but it's more than that. It's an examination of where our country has come from, where we are, and where we are going. I hope you'll take some time to read it this holiday season it's insightful and it's beautifully written as you would expect from someone with Tom's credentials. The author or co-author of eight previous nonfiction books, Tom serves as the politics editor of the Los Angeles Review of Books, is an associate professor of English at Chapman University and serves as a visiting professor of English at Dartmouth College. He's joined in eight tonight by Melinda Hennenberger, an editorial board member and columnist for the Kansas City Star. Hennenberger was a Pulitzer Prize finalist for commentary in 2019 and for editorial writing in 2020. Tom, Melinda, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. It's good to be here. Thank you, Steve. So Tom, I this is really an impressive book. Um, and I guess I want to just start with uh, talking about the title a little bit. When I first saw that it was Dispatches from a Changing America, um, that it's I was surprised that it wasn't a political book. I thought maybe from that, that it might be, you know, what do Trump voters really think? So I was a little relieved that it wasn't that at all. Um, so tell me about how you came to the title and also what you tell people when they say, what's your book about, Tom? Great question. Um, it is not a political book, but there are undercurrents to politics. You know, there are subsurfaces that cause changes in the electorate for sure. And so this is not an attempt to explain why uh, Americans voted the way they did, but it is an attempt to talk about the awareness of the United States, the way that uh, geography is in some sense determinative. And uh, just to make a very brief foray into uh, the electoral matter. Uh, there were 477 <laughs> counties that uh, that voted for Joe Biden, and there were 2,900 some uh, that voted for the incumbent. And when you look at those counties, you know it hues more or less to the famous urban-rural divide that we've heard so much about, but uh, also the income divide, uh, the diploma divide. You know, we are, uh, as we've been told, endlessly a polarized country. And uh, this comes down not so much to political opinions, but also these things going on underneath uh, the surface. And so that, you know, broader sense is what the book is about. The name of our incumbent president uh, occurs exactly once, just once. And uh, it's just a brief mention of his name up on one of his tacky Las Vegas hotels. That's it. That's all you get of the incumbent. Um, how do we come to the title? The original title was uh, Your Land, uh, per the Woody Guthrie song. You know, this sense of uh, responsibility, the sense of uh, um, patriotism and uh, ownership sense. Um, but uh, the, the decision was made, and I think it was a wise one to change it to uh, the, the National Road, which speaks to a country that, you know, thinks of itself as having been on the move. All of these. Uh, motions in our collective memory, many of them shrouded in inaccurate mythologies, you know, religious separatists arriving on uh, Cape Cod, mm -hmm. yeah. spreading out into the quote, quote, wilderness, which was not a wilderness at all. Uh, this, this idea of uh, movement, that we're a restless country. Um, but recent events kind of uh, are sand in the gears of that mythology. We're moving less now than at any time previously um, in, in our history. Uh, I thought enough, that was the uh, most uh, just, um, moving surprising show thing. That, uh, fewer Americans changed addresses uh, in 2018 um, than in any year prior to. 
Yeah, I was yeah. really surprised uh, by that just, when just really I goes saw against, uh... you had a stat in there that in 1950, one in five Americans changed the dress. And I guess it was in 18, one in nine, something like that. Um, of course, people aren't moving now with the pandemic, but, but why are we so much less mobile now? Did you lose? I think we're, we're having I've, a little problem with Tom's connection. Are you back, Tom? I phased out and now I'm back. All right, okay. Melinda, you want to just repeat that question? We'll just pick up there. Oh, sure. I was just saying I was so surprised that um, you had this stat in there that in 1950, one in five Americans changed their dress. And uh, I guess it was in 18, it's, it's only one in nine. So, you know, we're definitely less mobile during this pandemic, but why why are we staying put more when, as you say, our sense of ourselves really is a very mobile society? Right, right. Uh, it, it's a bifurcating economy. Um, you know, those counties that uh, did go for uh, the incumbent president, you, you look at uh, the, the production there, it's uh, agriculture, mining, and manufacturing primarily. Um, those 477 counties that uh, voted for uh, Biden, you know, you're looking at uh, uh, financial services, you're looking at uh, information-based ways of making a living. And, you know, uh, the, the internet has brought with it many things and um, it's made geography less important uh, if you are of a certain socioeconomic category. You can live anywhere. You can be a, a keyboard warrior from, you know, a Montana ranch famously. Uh, if you work in more rooted industries, healthcare, retail, et cetera, you know, you're stuck. And, uh, you know, rural America, this has been talked about a lot, you know, um, some of it is scandalous in the way that uh, these towns have, uh, have emptied out. Um, mm -hmm. My family uh, has its roots in Northeast Kansas, and uh, I've seen that go through sea changes, not all of them good. Yeah. My hometown, too, in southern Illinois, was very prosperous um, town where you could get anything, you know, where people made furniture and beautiful things. And so, you know, there were multiple um, dress shops where dresses were designed and actually made um, uh, jewelry stores. There's none of that right now. You can't hear me, can you? I can now hear you, Melinda. Okay. <laughs> the wonders of the internet we were just talking, weren't we? Yes, you said that, um, you quoted Larry McMurtry from Last Picture Show saying, you know, the it was only the kids who weren't curious and weren't at the top of the class who used to stay put, but that's no longer true. No longer true. Hmm. Um, you started this adventure, it sounds like, and maybe this whole way of life that because uh, you love driving from coast to coast and everywhere, you know, in between uh, in Kansas. So I thought you might want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, the book starts in, uh, the book starts in Kansas uh, near a place called a little Wakarusa Creek. Um, I got it into my mind that what a good idea it would be to uh, walk the entire length of the Santa Fe Trail. So, uh, you know, I quit my newspaper job in Wyoming and drove to Kansas City and found uh, a, a nice guy who let me park his, my car, my beat up Toyota Camry, you know, in his backyard and took the bus to the uh, Jackson County Courthouse there on the uh, square in Independence. I had a backpack, of course, and started walking. And uh, 68 days later, I, you know, straggled into uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. But, you know, it was in uh, that, that walk across Kansas, border to border, uh, east to west, that um, it, it began to sort of occur to me, um, this sounds like a silly thought, but just the, the, the sheer magnificence and breadth of the American continent and what a miracle it was that all of this is held together, um, you know, by a, a shared agreement on four broad sheet printed pages called the Constitution. And that, um, you know, I've never really truly believed in um, 
you know, all that much sort of regional differences in the United States. You know, I, mm. we were just talking about the importance of geography, but when you come down to it, you know, uh, the United States uh, has far more in common than uh, we have uh, uh, that's apart. And the, the, the glue that holds us together, even as we're pulled apart in these different economic and political directions, that is a source of intense fascination to me. Mm -hmm. And, but you've been driving, I mean, you drive all night, you drive. One of the most fascinating things to me was all these midnight adventures, like midnight hikes to see something obscure in the middle of, you know, in the dark. <laughs> So, you know, you're not, this is not a book where you're necessarily interviewing a lot of people or maybe not even chatting people up. Um, so what's, what's, what's the uh, midnight tourism about? Yeah, don't go on a road trip with me. I've just irritated <laughs> so many passengers. You know, I gotta take this detour to see this, you know. Um, viewers of a certain age may recall the, uh, the first vacation movie with the, you know, sort of the running joke about Clark W. Griswold, uh, you know, wanting to divert to see the world's largest fall of spring. Um, that's in Cocker City, Kansas, by the way, in case anyone wants to go see it. It's pretty awesome. Um, yeah, I'm that guy. Um, and uh, for various odd reasons, you know, I would find myself um, in, in front of historic sites of the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, known to all as the Mormons. And I'm not Mormon, uh, but I still found uh, the sanct there the, in in their cosmology, which um, you know, even though I'm not a member, I respect it. You know, the uh, sanctification of the American continent um, was a source of great fascination. And so, you know, uh, for whatever reason, maybe just because of my loopy um, travel habits, you know, I'd show up at night and sometimes go over the fence. You know, um, sorry, LDS Church. I hope that you're okay with that. But, Did that kind of heighten the experience? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe the, the the thrill, the forbidden fruit, was a, was a part of it. But it was also, you know, there's something about nighttime um, that lends itself to uh, mystery. You know, mm -hmm. landscapes in the night. Every painter knows this are not the same as they are in the daytime, and there is a a, a kind of a um, a spiritual cloaking. Um, that functions as, as this weird metaphor for, um, as human beings, our limited spiritual perception. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you said you were very, you were bowled over by this uh, landscape in Southern Illinois. No one has ever told me, that's where I'm from, <laughs> so no one has ever told me that. <laughs> I'm here to tell you, my first look, uh, Melinda, at uh, your, your, your girlhood cradle, uh, yeah. Was one that I've never forgotten. These uh, these these cities were 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 bathed in uh, nighttime splendor, such as uh, never anyone gazed on uh, Sparta or Athens or ancient Rome with the wonder that I uh, beheld Carbondale. Unique view. <laughs> <laughs> one of the most moving chapters was the last. Um, uh, there will, at the end, there will be strangers, I guess you called it, where you again drive across the country to see your, I guess your childhood home, your grandmother's home demolished. And you said, you know, you partly did that as a, um, to make it up to your grandmother in some way that you weren't able to be with her at the end. Um, what did you hope to, to get out of it and what, what, what did that experience tell you? Yeah, uh, the answer to the first part is I'm not sure. I think we obey uh, an obscure call when it comes to these places. I mean, uh, that house, um, you know, I've been taken to it since I was an infant. You know, when I was between things, I would, you know, go there and visit grandma and sleep on the couch. You know, I went over when I lived in Phoenix every Monday for dinner. You know, she was important to me. My uncle was important to me. And the house was important to them, you know, they, they were from the working class, you know, it was a hand-built house um, on land acquired during the Homestead Act, you know, so we got it for free. Um, and I think so many of us who face, who grew up in, you know, per the subtitle of the book, a changing America. And when we have, 
ground that is personally sacred to us when it moves on. And, you know, we sold this house, which was, a, as they say in real estate parlance, a teardown um, mm -hmm. to someone who was going to throw up their McMansion on it. You know, this presented a moral choice that I think a lot of us are faced with. If we could, would we go, want to go watch it being torn down? You know, and I think it's an awful thing to contemplate. And I really struggled with it. You know, like what, as you per very perceptively asked, Melinda, what, what do you gain from that? It's a horror. It's a horrible image, right? Why would you want that? This beloved structure. Well, I, I would think it would rip your heart out, right? I mean, that was it was awful. Did, right? Yeah, it, it was awful. But you know, there was a sense of you know obligation that you know, um, my World War II veteran um, step grandfather built the house from by, with his own hand, and you know, the uh, the the people who bought who bought the land were quite rude. You know, I did not enjoy their company. Um, but they did do one courtesy, which is to say, we're tearing down the house on X date at X time. And so um, it's one of those things that you will never experience again. You know, mm -hmm. you have one, you have one chance. And I thought better to take it than never experience it. And uh, yeah, it sucked. <laughs> but I'm really glad I did it um, because mm -hmm. it was a, a window, a visceral window into. Um, you know, time's moving hand, uh, as the Buddhists say, the only change is constant. And, you know, we see this in a physical way, particularly in the United States with our um, sometimes absurd rush to erase history. Mm -hmm. And you took away a memento. Yep, a uh, piece of brick, mm -hmm. piece of brick, uh, adobe brick, and it lives in a glass jar. <laughs> Do you think now that, uh that you've done this book, do you think you will keep collecting these places? You mean keep going to places? Oh, uh, I know you I, keep going to places, but in the same way. I would hope so. I mean, for as much as towns tend to look alike in the United States, I think there's peculiarities of each that are worth seeking out. And, um, you know, I, I keep coming back to Kansas. Kansas is just particularly delicious for this because, you know, there is a kind of railroad symmetry um, to these towns, most of which were in fact laid out as coaling stations or jerkwater towns, um, jerkwater being a particular railroad term, not meant as a pejorative, um, to the way that they look and the, the, the compact main streets, the grids, the street trees, you know, the VFW, the fire station, the water tower, the grain elevator, who doesn't love it? And, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they tend to blur together, but, you know, there's really something, I think, cool and unique about each one. And, you know, this goes without saying that the people in those towns are absolutely unique and irreplaceable, everyone. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people, even when they drive, they just make the track as quickly and um, anonymously as possible, you know, they don't stop to take it in. So I think that's something that your book has to give is to say, you know, I mean, I hadn't even, I haven't been to the spot in Independence where, you know, that's one of the holiest spots of Mormonism, which is interesting, you know, where, um, where I guess it's all gonna end. <laughs> Or uh, in, in their theology of eternal progression, where it's all going to begin again. Okay. No, but it, I, I will go see that now when, when the, maybe when we can get out a little more. Do you think that the pandemic has at all changed your idea of um, travel now? Not all, I mean, of course, it's put restrictions on what we can do, but for the future. Has it taught you something that you think you'll do differently? Yeah, I mean, Melinda, I don't go anywhere anymore. Um, yeah. And uh, there, there is a brief COVID essay in this book, you know, um, reported from Los Angeles, where I live, um, that talks about the way that this pandemic has um, shut us away, but it's also revealed some, you know, important mm -hmm. things. Uh, about the American character. And, you know, one of the things I really lament about um, this uh, national trauma that we've gone through, in addition to the 
quarter million that we've lost in addition to all the dreams that have been shattered and all the experiences we're not having you know mm -hmm. um I, I i really regret that we have um retreated into our um trying to not say the word bubble which has become such a cliche but the way that we've retreated into ourselves the way that we've retreated into deeper into our social circles when you know part of the problem that ails us politically and spiritually is that uh, we don't know each other you mm -hmm. know? Yeah, but maybe after this, people will be, I know, will be hungry to see each other and to hug and to move around and feel free again. So maybe it will be an opportunity to burst those bubbles. Who knows? We can only hope. I mean, what uh, it's been commonly observed that uh, what followed up the, um, uh, the 1918, uh, right. what's called the Kansas flu pandemic, which was really it's true place of origin. I think right. you wrote a, you wrote a column about that even, Yes. you know, but yeah. uh, what would follow it after that was the uh, economic and uh, cultural explosion of the 1920s. Mm -hmm. And so one might hope that we all have a pent up burst of, uh, of fervor that's uh, waiting to be unleashed, hopefully of a good kind. Well, you said in the book that it was also followed, the uh, 1918 epidemic was also followed by amnesia, that there's not a yeah. lot of art or books or, you know, other works about it. Yeah, that. yeah, curiously. I mean, it's almost like, uh, this is not an original thought, but, you know, the only quote unquote great novel to come out of the American Civil War was 22 years later by someone who hadn't even fought in it, Stephen Crane's The Red Badge of Courage. You know, uh, the only novel really that um, is still in print today that emerged from the uh, uh, pandemic, you know, was was a novella, even a short one by uh, Catherine Ann Porter, um, Bell Horse, Bell Rider. Mm -hmm. My Kentucky grandmother lived through that time and she never wanted to talk about it. So maybe there was that too. You know, yeah, because I was fascinated just by the little bits I could, you know, get out of her. But, you know, that things were like, yeah, too, right? I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. Trying in the house and, uh, you know, being there for two, three days before the undertaker could come. And I guess my family and a lot of families took in a lot of kids because their parents had died. So, Awful. yeah, yeah. Um, another very um, sad chapter in your book to me was the late city final about um, a, it's a, a kind of an obituary for the newspaper business, or at least I read it as such. Um, so maybe you want to talk a little bit about that and then um, I can say why I, I hope it's not an obit. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's not either. Um, I, I will sort of shake a metaphor, metaphorical fist here, not just at the internet, but um, at all my stupid bosses and all my stupid owners that, uh, you know, used to run these, you know, stupid news bosses. Yeah, imagine that in the newspaper <laughs> business that you'd have like idiot management. You know, M Melinda, they really should have gotten ahead of this. You know, they should have. Uh, been aware that this unstoppable digital force was on the way and that, you know, we could have uh, invented Google, we could have invented Facebook, we could have like the phone companies did such a brilliant job at, you know, uh, marshalling new technologies and, you know, getting ahead of a uh, communications wave, you know, phones are now ir 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 inescapable. Newspapers could have done the same thing, you know, right. and that, you know, we were paid so low, Melinda. I mean, I should only speak for myself here. I hope you were Oh, paid. yes. When I read your salary in there, I'm like, wow, he made 2K more than I did. <laughs> <laughs> Woo hoo Where the money? It's the life of kings and queens, but it's the crap pay. But, you know, let me go back to my, go back to my Jeremiah and my anger here at, you know, the, the, the ownership for, you know, taking so much of the profit margin. I mean, so bloody stupid. You know, when it came to failing to make the moves that would have, you know, gotten ahead of Craigslist, you know, kept the revenue somehow from classified ads, or at least kept the eyeballs that uh, classifieds would have brought. And, you know, made newspapers the information standard um, for right. this age that we're now in, which is just so uh, destructively 
uh, fragmented. And, you know, for me, I, I think of cities, uh, great American cities, not so much for their NFL teams, but for their newspapers, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I'm reluctant to play this game because I'm afraid I'm going to get humbled. But if you name me like a city of any size above 100,000, I bet I can name you the newspaper, the daily. Right. So like, like I say, I'm reluctant. Maybe you'll stump me. But I'm not going to test you. I, I, I trust you on that. You know. Yeah. And on, um, a, on a personal note, you know, it was so disappointing to me. Well, uh, the one time we met in person was great. Um, but it was so disappointing that the KC Star had left its beautiful historic building, you know, and that's yet another civic, damn it, you know, because you have but to you know, that. now we're, now we're leaving our uh, beautiful newish building. We're downsizing again. And you know what? I'm not crying. You know why? Because I think it's really important to keep money and salaries, right? So every beautiful Taj Mahal newspaper. Yes, it's it really is sad, but it's so much more important to be able to keep doing the work we're doing. So, you know, like the most beautiful newspaper office I ever saw was the Denver Post, the one right across from the Capitol with yep. balconies yep. all around. Oh my gosh, so gorgeous. And, you know, a minute later, they were barely um, hanging on. So I, I then always thought a beautiful building is probably the kiss of death in our business. <laughs> and in and, and the current state, you're absolutely right. But there's yeah. just something so powerfully symbolic about the LA Times standing a flank from City Hall, like watching it. You know, right. the Denver Post gazing over the Capitol. You know, you got to answer to the right. public here, politicians. And, you know, that sort of uh, physical uh, sensibility of the of the newspaper. I completely agree with you. I mean, you know, now we're way out of the era of, you know, publishers temples to themselves, like Colonel McCormick's Chicago Tribune building right there on the on the river. Right. Those days those days are over, but yeah. still one mourns. Oh yes. Well, I do think that um, our function is more important than it has ever been. I mean, in the, you know, they can say fake news, but somebody does, ha I mean, our, our role in democracy and protecting democracy, I think has been thrown into sharp relief in recent years. But I have a couple questions here from the audience I want to ask you. Uh, someone asked, did I read correctly that at one point you wanted to climb to the highest point in each state? Any particular tales from that quest that you'd like to share? Oh, 100 percent. And uh, <laughs> this, this is all in the book. Uh, it's not just one point. I've always, well, not always, but since I was 22, wanted to do this. And uh, I got 44, 44 out of 50. I got five really hard ones and Florida to... Um, to summit, if uh, that's the right word in Florida. Um, I want to give special praise to the Kansas High Point, um, which is uh, a big swale located uh, right on the Colorado border. Um, I went there at night. Again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, it was, it was a, a profoundly uh, spiritual, weird, and even frightening experience. I'll put it that way. So there's a long essay in this book about um, climbing those high points. Uh, Missouri did a terrible job on its high point, I'm sorry to say. Um, God did not. God knew what you know he was doing by putting it in the Ozarks on a place called Tom Sock. Uh, but the um, state of Missouri did a lousy job of uh, developing it, and now it's just sort of what we call a drive up. You go and park your car and you walk, you know, this piddly little quarter mile through the woods, and there you are. Woohoo. It's what, not, it's not a great experience. Kansas, so, what made the Kansas high point terrifying? Something about being on the plate of the prairie and watching transcontinental jets, you know, pass far, far, far overhead as anyone who's um, been out there in the middle of nowhere in Western Kansas in the middle of the night. And something about that concentrated essence, you might call it, of the entire state of Kansas and that you know, this is, you know, a normal person would probably consider this silly. It's just like a piece of trivia. It's a topographical, topographical asterisk. Who cares? Um, but something about it just being the place, the highest place, uh, gives it a, a, a kind of 
strange magnificence. And uh, I think I've already said, I think Kansas has a strange magnificence about it. And nowhere do you see this um, in, in this weird, almost like holy of holy sort of way, like you're treading on uh, kind of a sacred ground. I keep coming back to that term, you know, sacred. And again, I can't explain it. And I realize this sounds silly. Um, it doesn't sound silly. Yeah, there's this wrought iron sculpture there. You know, somebody has a joke called it Mount Sunflower. Ha ha. You know, the only, you know, not even a mountain in Kansas. But, you know, it's still, you know, in its own way, just as uh, those those enormous vistas in Western Kansas tend to be mm -hmm. beautiful. This one is indeed beautiful uh, at night. I cannot vouch for it during the day. <laughs> Next time I'm on my way to Colorado, I'm going to stop. Yeah, it's about a good 45 minutes down dirt roads off I-70. So definitely budget at least an hour and a half for it. All right. So there's another question. It's kind of ironic that at a time when society is more mobile than it's ever been, we have in a lot of ways a worse understanding of people from different walks of life. Did your travels, this is a great question, did your travels offer any hints as to how we might rectify that? Gosh, um, I can tell you that we have been, um, at least in my lifetime, I'd venture to say at any point, you know, since the uh, since the Civil War, really been driven apart and um, lacking in a common purpose as um, Americans. Um, uh, I blame the internet for some of that. Um, the information fragmentation um, that's occurred with, um, we tend to go to the, you know, information sources that make us feel good, <laughs> that reaffirm our confirmation bias and, you know, flatter our worldviews. I'm as guilty of that as anyone. Uh, it's true. Um, we've lost a, a, a kind of a, a friendship with each other. And, you know, I see this in myself. I've become a lot more impatient, you know, um, one, one, constant force that I have to fight against in my um, just travels is, of course, there's always a schedule, but, you know, slow down, you know, try and initiate um, conversations. Um, just to be a little bit geeky about it, you know, there was uh, an influential essay written by uh, a guy named Benedict Anderson, um, who coined the phrase, imagined communities, that you know, nations become nations, nations that are widespread, that are continental in scope, like the US and Russia, you know, that have uh, only uh, railroads, transportation that is, and newspapers to hold them together, the sense that everyone is reading the same, same thing at the same mm -hmm. time, and that we have a kind of a template for understanding each other and sharing the same values, even if we may never meet. You know, um, that idea of share, imagine communities in America is under stress. Well, poisoning our views of one another has become a big business. So it's not all accidental, right? You know? Yeah, 100%. I mean, yeah, it's an industry. So here's another question. Do you remain positive about our shared connectedness, connectedness to the land? Or do you fear it's eroding along with so many other semblances of national unity? I am optimistic uh, on many fronts. And uh, this is one of them, the shared land. Uh, famously, uh, America as an idea, you know, uh, certainly imperfectly executed, absolutely. But, you know, what's in the Constitution, what's in the Declaration of Independence is a really good idea. Um, and, you know, our modern nation was founded on that. But what we have, uh, our lowest common denominator remains the soil, remains the shared um, real estate between Canada and Mexico, between the Atlantic and the Pacific. We live here together and we got to live with each other. We're roommates. We're inescapable. You know, this is what we fought the Civil War to keep together, you know, which was a, uh, a separatist conflict that was, you know, geography was profoundly entangled in that. You just can't take a piece of American land and walk away with it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, we just can't, you know, walk away with, with our cities. I really hate sometimes these internet memes, and I'm sure people have seen them, you know, the proposals for splitting up, you know, red America and blue America, you know. 
we'll take uh, we'll take Chicago. You take uh, Little Rock. You know that sort of thing. Yeah, no way. Well, it's impossible anyway. We're too intertwined. It would never work. Ah, frozen. Yes. Can you hear me now? <laughs> I can hear you now. That got caught okay. in the uh, teeth of the internet. So go for Very it again. Good. Um, what was your favorite part of researching and writing the book? Oh, wow. Um, favorite part? That is a great question. Um, the book kind of came together um, accidentally. You know, um, some of these uh, have been previously published. Uh, most of them are original. But I realized uh, in thinking about it, I always come back to geography as a subject, you know, the awareness of the land. And, you know, I remain um, ambivalent about the idea of um, environmental determinativism. You know, does where we live shape us as people? You know, I think there's some evidence for that. I also think there's some contrary evidence for that. Mm -hmm. But was there was there one chapter in the book or one story in the book that that was particularly delightful for you? Uh, we've talked about the one watching my grandma's house got uh, getting knocked down. That really sucked. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, you know the uh, Mormon historical sites at night. You know, mm -hmm. um, didn't enjoy writing the um, teutative obit for uh, uh, for newspapers um climbing all those uh high points uh that was occasionally terrifying you know when 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 you're there that's what uh what hikers call level two fun you know the type of experience that uh is really terrible when it's happening to you you know painful scary whatever but you know it's a fun story to tell at the bar later is there some of that when you're doing this that you know you're thinking about the story <laughs> Yeah, I, I suspect, uh, and I think this is true of uh, most journalists I know, and I bet it's true for you too, that when you're having an experience, Melinda, uh, sometimes you, you you can almost see the way that the sentences are coming together and the way that it's going to emerge on the page. Does that happen to you when you're column writing? Well, I definitely, you know, Nora Ephron said everything's material, right? So, I, I mean, I definitely tend to see everything as a potential column. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, I mean, so uh, my husband and I have twins who are 24 years old now, but even when they were little, they say, this is off the record. <laughs> <laughs> Never write about it, mom. I love it. Uh, no, I really didn't, but we have another question here. In the course of your travels, did you encounter moments that busted some stereotypes or alternatively just ran counter to your expectations? Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. I mean, the United States is absolutely full of surprises. People with uh, unusual hobbies, people with uh, unusual beliefs, you know, uh, some of them will absolutely talk your ear off. Um, I've never been good at extracting myself from long conversations. So, you know, that's that's part of the territory. Um, but yeah, just uh, strange things. Uh, in the town of Quartzsite, Arizona, you know, I ran into a guy who ran a bookshop who called himself Sweet Pie. Uh, he was also a, a, a nudist who uh, kept his privates in a, uh, um, a piece of cloth that I can only describe as like the size and shape of a hacky sack, you know. And, you know, that. <laughs> The guy went on and on about how he had been on the Jay Leno program and, you know, was a professional piano player and, you know, earned his way through uh, Boston University by playing in bar rooms for tips, you know, uh, a guy who managed a grocery store in uh, Superior, Nebraska, who uh, told me that uh, he had been stationed in Antarctica when he was in the army, you know. Um, there's a lot of uh, incredible experience out there. And uh, I think one of the tragedies of, 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 of being alive in the United States, among many things, is that there's so many of these stories you never get to hear. But there's so many people who don't want to hear them, right? I mean, who don't have time to listen to each other. I think that's a big, you know, it's, as a journalist, uh, it's, 
you know, it, you better like listening to people. And it's great because people don't get listened to. So it's a good match. <laughs> it can right? be. It, David Halberstam said like America was a wonderful country to be uh, in which to be a journalist because as he said, everybody talks. Yeah. Yeah, that's a little less true than it used to be, <laughs> you know, that there's more wariness <laughs> where when I was starting out a long, long time ago, you know, you might get a little teasing for being a reporter, but not hostility. And now sometimes you do. Right. So Right. I, I truly, truly lament that, you know, yeah. um, I, I truly believe that we're the quote unquote good guys, you know, and the Well, uh, just ask us. And we'll tell you, we'll tell you how uh, great we are. Do you think though that uh, there were some stereotypes that got busted for you? Huh? Strip? Let's see. Not all country people are kind. <laughs> 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 well, as someone who grew up in the country, who told you that? <laughs> yeah, I growing up in the suburbs of Tucson, Arizona, I guess I had a gauzy vision of you know these this sort of Thornton Wilder, you know, oh, kindness, the noble and, agrarian. Yeah, idea. yeah, yeah. That, no way. And you know, that's not to say that they're all mean and backwards like a Sinclair Lewis novel, but you know, uh, I did encounter, you know, some cases of outright, you know, selfishness and cruelty in small town America. You know, um, let's see. Uh, one stereotype that I uh, can confirm, um, there's an essay in there about, uh, you know, living in New York City as someone who was, you know, also sort of had a gauzy view of that place. Unrealistic. Um, by and large, uh, most of the folks that I met who uh, worked on Wall Street um, had a bit of a sociopathic streak to them. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a stereotype that's, uh, that's true. And uh, I'll not tell you, out of nowhere. No. And um, those folks who uh, emerged from these uh, elite universities that you know, used to pride themselves on, you know, uh, total uh, humane education and teaching great moral virtues. Um, I can tell you that uh, it's possible to graduate from uh, Harvard, uh, Princeton, or Yale, um, uh, completely uncaring about your fellow human being. Yeah, maybe from anywhere. You can, you can be either way, right? And that's true in small town America as well. But yeah. yes. So in answer to that question, yeah. Um, you know, to, to quote uh, one, one of the greatest anti-racism statements I've ever read um, from uh, a, a white guy, uh, as it happens, came from P.J. O'Rourke, you know, the um, conservative humor writer who, right. who, who, said, who wrote something very simple. And, you know, um, it's so true. People everywhere are exactly alike. You know, yeah. you're, you go to any country on this earth. I've been quite privileged to have been to 50 or more of them. And, you know, you won't find too much substantial difference in between you and the next person. Like if you really, you know, spend the time. Human nature. Yep. Here's, here's another question. You said the book mentions the incumbent president just once, but your story seems to beg the question. In your conversations with people, did you come to a better understanding of what it is about Donald Trump that might appeal to half the country. Yeah, I mean, there is a sense of uh, disconnection, uh, a sense of alienation. Um, to use the phrase of George Packer, we've had an unwinding in this country um, in between, um, and sorry to reduce it to these gross stereotypes, but you know, the, 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 the cultural elite, um, the less than 500 counties that, uh, that voted blue in this election, roughly speaking, and the 2,900 or so counties that, you know, went the other direction, sometimes vehemently in the other direction. And this is a sense that, you know, the, the, the shared purpose um, is no longer there. Certainly the shared economy uh, is, is no longer there. The feeling of, you know, somehow um, rightfully so being cheated, um, not to turn this into some sort of, you know, economic rant, but the disparity in between CEO and, you know, lowest wage salaries is an absolute um, scandal. Um, you know, when uh, I'm, I was a young reporter when NAFTA passed and, you know, sort of bought into, 
um, all of the paradise of uh, low wages and you know new jobs that that would bring. I think that that did way more harm than good. Um, in the sense of course, of, uh, Bernie Sanders spoke about all those things too, and many other politicians. Is was there something you learned? Uh, in all your travels about what it is about Donald Trump that has spoken to people in a way that really no other politician has the who I recall. I mean, who has the kind of loyalty that, well, really goes beyond loyalty, who can definitely get away with things no other politician has been able to get away with. Yeah, I mean, it, it's all, it's like his dark art, you know, like uh, from the very first time that uh, I heard him um, speak uh, politically many years ago, I thought he was a clown, you know, like a total idiot. Nothing he's ever said is really connected with me. And I fail to understand, you know, the, the alleged charisma that he has. He seems like, frankly, a horse's ass to me. Um, that said, I used to think that this dark art that he's spreading throughout the country must have been racism because there's no other answer. Uh, that was my, I'm going to confess, that was my original sort of like simplistic answer to this. But I think that they, it's more complicated than that, obviously. He um, speaks in simple language. And I'm not saying that people are stupid who follow him, but I am saying that he cuts through a lot of what has been perceived as condescension. And he speaks on um, a level that um, expresses the same sort of catharsis and frustration that we've become used to in the last 30 minutes of an action movie when the hero is finally going to kill the bad guys, when we're finally going to stop pussyfooting around. Um, I think that there's something to be said for that kind of um, great man quality that we uh, hunger for. Um, and, you know, some of the roads that uh, we shouldn't turn this as political, but some of the roads that uh, the Democratic Party goes down and all of its, you know, amorphous octopus confusion um, tend to alienate um, some voters and there's a failure to understand just like what a you know carnival mess the Democratic Party always has been and you know how when you know you you vote for that candidate you're not necessarily voting for what folks say on the fringes mm-hmm Here's another question. Are you tempted to retrace your steps four years from now to see if the tenor has changed? Oh my gosh, absolutely. <laughs> I would so love to go back to Little Wakarusa Creek, um, back to San Antonio, back to Flagler Beach, Florida, you know, um, maybe someday. <laughs> maybe uh, when the vaccine arrives. Never thought I'd cheer for Big Pharma, by the way, but you yeah. know. Well, Fauci now says we, some people will be getting it very soon, getting a vaccine, so. Uh, yeah. Here we go. Like at the very beginning of this, uh, we watched uh, that movie Contagion uh, over here. Uh, fantastic uh, movie whose, you know, running message is uh, <laughs> trust the government officials to do the right thing. And uh, boy, was our face shaken in that, eh? Yeah, yeah, on many levels. So we're almost out of time, but what what would you like people to know about your book that nobody well, has asked? Yeah, you know, essay collections are, are sort of like a Whitman sampler, you know. Um, there's 14 of them in here. Um, they're kind of, some of them are a little wacky. Um, hopefully they all speak to this condition of American uh, geography in their own ways. And, you know, uh, think of it like a box of candies, you know, if, if the caramel's not for you, maybe the, maybe you'll enjoy the mint. <laughs> One of them is uh, entirely about the state of Nevada. It's called Searchlight. And um, it's about uh, my experience with that just utterly beguiling um, state. Um, uh, let me make one more Kansas reference here. There is a connection. Um, my family was friends for years with a guy who ran a gas station in the town of Beatty, Kansas, which is in Marshall County. Um, and, you know, he did okay as, uh, as a guy who uh, ran the SO station as it was in Beatty. And he, he would save up his money and every uh, six months or so he'd fly himself to Las Vegas where he was one of these guys who was treated like a big high roller. You know, he got all kinds of comps, you know, just because he would make big wagers. He knew what he was doing. Sometimes he would come back to this tiny town. Beatty has maybe 300 people in it. 
um, back with a big wad. And, you know, that's his, his name is Vester, wonderful man. It, it, it struck me that uh, Vester was as much a citizen of Las Vegas as he was of Beatty, Kansas. Mm -hmm. And if there's any state in these United States, which is, you know, founded on this idea, uh, the journalist Mark Cooper has called it the last, well, thank you, well, the last honest town in the United States where you just see the naked, naked capitalism uh, yeah. on display, the way that money will buy you anything as long as you behave yourself and you don't mess with other people. You know, mm -hmm. it's got a code to it. You know, I, I find Nevada fascinating. And so just the entire state, this essay searchlight is uh, a, a look to the heart of Nevada culture that also pays a visit to Area 51, the only legal place where you can look into Area 51. I did not trespass there. <laughs> uh, also the Nevada National Security Site, you, you formerly known as the Nevada Test Site, where um, hundreds of uh, fission and fusion weapons were detonated during the Cold War, and which our incumbent fancy, let's reopen that, let's start retesting nuclear weapons. It's a forbidden geography. I did get in there legally. Um, but it's all in service of uh, writing about Nevada, which is a unique American state. There are a lot of other books about being on the road. Do you think that any of them were a little bit of a model for you or that you think you could compare this to? Yes, uh, I'm so glad you asked. Uh, my uh, great, great uh, grandfather served in the Kansas state legislature. Here's another Kansas story. He was one of uh, Alf Landon's uh, mm -hmm. right-hand man. In fact, there was a time where he got a plum position as the uh, head of the Department of Highways in the state of Kansas. Uh, uh, James uh, James Monroe Rhodes was his name. He had a wonderful library, uh, a, very, a library similar in dimensions, by the way, Melinda, that uh, is behind you, you know, like one of these wall-length temples of books. And on this shelf, uh, this wonderful shelf, they got these their books by mail in those days, quite similar to Amazon through the Book of the Month Club. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, right. they weren't... They, they weren't driving to Kansas City with a truck loading up on books. They were getting these books through uh, the Railway Express Agency. And uh, one of them was uh, this uh, now ne ne neglected, not totally forgotten book called Inside USA, uh, published in 1947 by the then uh, phenomenal former newspaper journalist, John Gunther, he used to work for the Chicago Daily News. And it is the most entertaining, it's almost like a narrative almanac um, that I've ever read that, you know, he visited all 50 states and said something really substantial and meaningful about all of them oh, wow. and summarized the United States. Yeah, in a way that still holds up. You know, this book is uh, more than 50 years old, but those observations about the, 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 the character of North Dakota, you know, the uh, whirligig nature of uh, New York City, you know, the, the, the famous reticence of uh, New Hampshire, you know, all of that is, 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 is on display in this book. And I just thought, man, I can never write anything like this. But, you know, maybe as a, a, a little dessert course, you might say, um, to Gunther's magnificent accomplishment. And so he's explicitly credited in the, in the afterword. So you read, well, see, that's the part I didn't read, the afterword. Um, you read that as a kid and kind of thought that sounds like fun yeah i've never forgotten that book and you know um he made uh, being that sort of uh journalist who goes into the united states and just you know quite humbly not arrogantly you know ask questions and he had two brilliant questions which i you know still use to this day i, I have totally borrowed them from john gunther um number one who runs this place you know, <laughs> where's the center of power? And, you know, obviously the days of machine politics aren't what they used to be, but, you know, you get some interesting answers when it comes to local power structures, local economies, you know, there are in every city, there are invisible webs of power that run. Right. Um, Gunther's second question, which is equally good. Um, he asked, he asked people, anyone who would stand still, um, what makes this place unique? What distinguishes uh, this town or this state from, from, from every other one. And, you know, you get a variety of answers. And, you know, um, people have really thought about this, you know, the place where they live, why is it different? You know, I've, I said earlier in this conversation that every town in Kansas kind of 
can look the same if you're not paying attention, but every one of them, every single one is unique. I'm surprised people would answer that question because uh, in some places, because there's so much Midwestern modesty uh, that, oh gosh, we're just like, uh, you know, there's nothing special. There's, I remember I got into um, a campaign van once uh, with a, a very young reporter and everyone was saying who, where they were from. And she said, you know, Oh, I'm from big Iowa. <laughs> so, my you know the, I'm you sorry. Know the old joke, you know the old joke about the uh, the Bostonian uh, Brahmin who then uh, corrects her and says, oh dear, no, 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 it's pronounced Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> nope, did not. Well, thank you so much. This was really fun to talk to you about your book, and it really is quite an achievement. So I hope you're going to enjoy all this. All thank the you. Thank, thank you, Melinda. And if I can return the compliment, um, uh, first, let me say thanks to the KC Public Library for, for doing this. Um, it's, a, it's a tremendous system, and it's a great honor to, uh, to be hosted by them, as well as Rainy Day Books, where uh, I did uh, one of my very first readings, actually, in 2006. Um, wonderful store um, that every uh, Kansas Cityan should should know intimately. And uh, also, again, uh, not to, you know, embarrass you or flatter you, but thank you so much for what you do. Um, oh, and thanks, being Tom. such a, a strong and vibrant voice for, uh, for Kansas City. Um, you know, I would buy the KC Star from <laughs> <laughs> um, from the rack outside Dot's Diner in uh, in Frankfort, Kansas, when I was just uh, you know 13 years old, and I thought it was a magnificent paper, and uh, you continue that tradition. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it.